Thank you. Turn in your Bibles to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for this day you've given us. We thank you for the many wonderful things you have done for us. We just ask now, Lord, please be with me as I present your word, Lord, and just help it to come across clearly. And Lord, help us to change the things in our hearts and in our lives that we need to change to become more like you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Back when I was in college, I had one of my classes, and it was a counseling course, and our teacher had put together a, like a PowerPoint and, and a lesson, and it was something I thought was very, very good, very good and helpful for all of us, and so I borrowed that and you know made some adjustments here and there to it, but what I'm going to present to you is we're going to talk about relationships and conflicts in relationships. Uh, the heart of the problem and the question is is why are there family conflicts why do we have all these conflicts in our home in our marriages in our relationships with our children family members people at church and so on and so on we're all we all have many different relationships that we're in and so I'm going to start this off by just showing you a quick little video clip here I look I was just trying to make a point well, a little space to myself downstairs. Then why didn't you say that instead of giving a big speech about how you have nothing? I did. When did you say, excuse me, I just need some space right now in my office? When I sighed. <laughs> you sighed? Yeah, I went... <sighs> I'm supposed to know what that means? Yes, because when you went... I gave you the bathroom. <laughs> Oh, come on, you practically fogged up the mirror with you. <sighs> Meantime, you didn't get the message even though I had to go, oh, 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 oh. Okay, fine. Well, give I me just... a second, I'm a little dizzy. <laughs> if, if I did sigh, I didn't mean anything by it. Oh, no, 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 no. I know you too well. I know exactly what it meant. It meant, you smell, get out. <laughs> Ray, you may smell, but you are. Well, I didn't mean it. Well, why did you say it? I was being nice. Well, this should be a little lesson for you. You should always mean what you say. And you should always mean what you sigh. <laughs> you want to know why I sigh? It's like a pressure valve. A release. Living with you, if I didn't sigh every once in a while, I would explode. <laughs> Oh, Chloe, you think that you're so easy to live with? Yes, as a matter of fact, I think I'm very easy to live with. <laughs> ha! You are so wrong. Open up the window and let some of the wrong out. You, you, you have so many annoying habits. Oh, yeah? Like what? Okay, uh, you know how uh, when you read your magazine in bed and you lick your fingers before you turn every page? So? I hate that. Get out of here! Oh, yes, yes, because you slurp your finger. Slurp? This is not a slurp. Oh, it's a slurp, okay? It's right next to my ear. <laughs> and then you, you take your wet thumb and you put it on the page, which, by the way, is disgusting. Oh, 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 I'm sorry I'm disgusting you while you're trying to clean your toenails with a hanger. <laughs> to see if it works, okay? And it does. For the big toe. Okay, fine. And I lick my finger when I read a magazine. If that's all you got, you got it pretty good. Well, I got plenty more, sister. I got plenty more. All right? 
I always loved that sitcom when it was on, just love watching it. It reminds me of my Italian family, you know, with different situations there. But guys, that show was so good and so popular because you can relate to it, right? I mean, husband, wife, all the different little situations and the fights between mom, dad, you know, the different things. And then, you know, with, with the couple there, we can relate to it. We get it. We understand it. And so today we're going to talk about family conflicts and how they get started. And then obviously, well, how do we resolve those things? What's the solution? And so now let's please go to your Bibles, James chapter 4, and we will begin reading in verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that the spirit he causes us to live in us envies intensely? But he gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve and mourn and wail. Cleanse your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. And so what we're going to look at here is our family conflicts and all the things that arise, and how, how do we get there even to begin with? And so what we have here is we have a happy little family. They're on vacation. They're probably here in Florida, sitting there on a park bench and, you know, looking out there on the Gulf. And just, you know, very beautiful sight. Many people love to come here. It's like you know, one of the most popular vacation destinations in, in the country. And so we all have desires. And our, our dad says, I'm in the mood for deep sea fishing. He's looking out on the water. Maybe he sees a boat out there, and he's thinking of how nice it would be to be on a boat just you know, out there fishing. And the mom, she's like, I want to go shopping at those cute little seaside shops. You know, right behind them on the street, there's all these neat little stores that have souvenirs, clothing items, you know, th th you know places are very interesting things there. And the daughter I wish Jed were here. She's a teenager. All she can think about is her boyfriend back home. That's the only thing that gives her meaning to her life. And then you have the one that complains. I'm hot. I'm tired. I'm bored. Let's go home. Every family always seems to have that one little complainer, right? <laughs> and then you have the little boy. I want to go swimming. You know, poor kid, I mean, that's like torture for a little boy sitting there, sitting on a bench right there at the beach, looking at that beautiful water. It's hot outside, and all he does is he wants to go swimming. We all have desires. Nothing wrong with it. We all have desires, things that we want. But as you're on vacation, can everybody do what everybody wants to do at that moment in time? No. Now, our desires grow into needs. And if you think about it, you know, first the, the thought, you see something, comes across. And then the more you begin to think about it and dwell on that, then these, you know, things that we want, they grow into needs. Like, I need this. And Dad says, I need some relaxation on a fishing boat. He's thinking of how nice, how chill, relaxed, kick back that it'll be sitting there on the fishing boat. Mom I need some souvenirs for our friends and family. You know, she's thinking of others and how, yeah, I'm going to you know, buy some things, show them our appreciation for them. And then, I need my best friend, Jed. She, she, she can't get her mind off, off her little love. She just keeps thinking about Jed. And then, I need my TV, my DVD, my Xbox, and my AC. None of those are here except maybe the AC. <laughs> 
And then the little boy, I need to cool off. You know, it is hot. I'm pouring sweat. I see that water out there in front of me. I just need to cool off. And so our needs, our, our, our wants grow into needs. Then needs produce judgments. And what we mean by that is, I paid for this vacation. I deserve to go fishing. You know, as, as, as a dad, you work hard. You've had a long week, long month, long year, whatever it is. And you're looking there and you're like, I paid for this vacation. I deserve this. And mom, I do, I do, I do for all of you, and now is my chance to do something for myself. Now, ladies, and I can say this even for my wife, is she will give, 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 do everything for everybody in the house. She leaves herself last to take care of anything that, you know, she would like, need, want, buy, whatever. And there are times where I will have to say, honey, just go do it. Do something for yourself. You know, a lot of times as men, though, sometimes we miss that. But as I've got older and smarter and being married longer, <laughs> realize that, that, you know, they, you need to, you know, like, send them off, do it. But you can see, though, how she's sitting there. I do everything for all you guys. Now is my time. I want to do what I would like to do here. And then I've sacrificed enough for this happy family vacation. And they're the complainer that she's like, I've given you guys all you're going to get. I'm not happy about this. I'm not happy about being here. And then the little, poor little guy, he's a littlest. He gets overlooked. And he's like, we never do what I want to do. And I know when I was really young and little, you always kind of felt that way. The adults and all the older ones, they got, you know, what they wanted. And you're just kind of left out there. He makes my life bearable. You know, she, she's still, you know, just still, you know, in, in her own little uh, dream world there. But nonetheless, our, our needs produce judgments. I deserve. And then, here's the important one, though. Unmet needs bring punishment. People will act a different way when they do not get what they want. You, personally, we all have different things, but when I don't get some from my wife, or my wife doesn't get some from me, or your kids, or whatever, you will act in a certain way to get them to give you what you want. Example. I'll be silent and let you see the pain that your selfishness has brought me. Guys, is there nothing worse than when your wife gives you the silent treatment? You know she's mad, right? And you're just sitting there and you're like, huh, I'm a talker. I, mean, I always got to fill space with, you know, talking and my wife's a talker. So when there's silence, you know, you're, there's something wrong. And, you know, you'll be sitting there talking, saying all this nice stuff, hoping she'll start talking back to you. Nothing right? And guys, you know you're in trouble, right? And you feel so bad, sometimes it might carry on for a good while, and it's just that real uneasiness. And not all, but a lot of people, even guys included, when they don't get their way, this is one of those mechanisms that people will use to, I'm going to punish you because you did not give me what I want. I'll complain and gripe about our stupid family, now, guys, as parents, you know, if you have that one, they complain, they complain, they complain, they complain. They complain so much that finally, is there times where you're like, fine, just do what you want because you're tired of listening to it, right? Don't parents give in? Don't you? Haven't you? I have given in because they just keep going and going and going and you just, just, just can be quiet so you don't have to listen to it. And that's another one of those mechanisms, ways of, you didn't give me what I want. I'm not happy about it. I'm going to let you know. And I'm going to make your life miserable till you give me what I want. Then I'll cry because I'm sad. Now, you know, when you've got little babies and they need to eat, need their diaper change, we all get that. We understand. But what about a little kid when they don't get their way and they throw a fit or they cry? And you're just like, oh, it's just like, you know, after a while you just can't handle it. And so sometimes... You either punish them, send them off away, or there again, you give in to what they want. And there again, that's another mechanism to getting what you don't want when you do it. Now, adult men, I hope you guys don't do that to your wife, start crying and you know, get your way, but <laughs> might be a few of you, I don't know. And I'll be dis distant and distracted. 
And those of you who have teenagers or have had teenagers and they get to like junior high age, sometimes that's their way of, you know, just kind of, you know, I'm off, I'm here, you don't know anything about my life, I'm not telling you, even if you try to pry it on me, I'm not saying much. And there again, that's kind of one of those things that they'll do just to kind of get at you because they know it's going to bother you so that they can get their way. And then dad, guys, have you been here? I'm going fishing while my family waits. I don't care what they think. I'm the dad. I'm the head of the household. I'm just going to go. And sometimes we've done things like that. And there again, your family's sitting back there and they're miserable. And you just go on your way and do your, do your thing because I'm going to get my way even if they don't want to do what I want to do. And so unmet needs bring punishment. Now, why are there family conflicts? Now, these are some of the points that we just went through. And the first one is, I desire. You, you see some, like I said, there's nothing wrong with that. God created us to, you know, want to do things and have desires and such. And it's the I want. And then from there, it goes to I demand. I need it. You know, the more you think about it, you're like, wow. So I'm thinking about this. I, I really do need, you know, whatever that is. And then it moves on to I judge where I deserve this. I've worked hard, I earn a lot of money, I take care of my family, or I work around the house, I take care of my family, whatever it is, I really deserve this. And think about, you know, you're sitting there, you're watching television, watching one of your little sitcoms, favorite programs, whatever it is, and they have these lovely things in between them that are called commercials. They're trying to sell you a product, right? Right? And you can be sitting there, minding your own business, not hungry, not wanting any certain thing, and all of a sudden, you know, McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, uh, Doritos, whatever comes on the screen. Or you see a car commercial, and it's a really nice car, and, you know, the guy is driving it, the top's down, the wind is blowing through his hair, and the girl's sitting next to him, they're having a great time. And all of a sudden, you know, first you just see it, don't think anything of it. And then as you sit there and dwell on it, you're like, man, I'm hungry, right? <laughs> and you're like, I need to go to McDonald's or I need to go, you know, to the cupboard, see if we have any Doritos in there. Or, you know, you're sitting there and, you know, like I said, you see, you see the car and you're like, wow. And then as you think even more on it, you're like, I could see myself top down, driving, wind blowing through the hair I have left, looking real cool. Maybe not as cool as the guy in, the, in this commercial, but there I am, and then it goes from, you didn't only just, you know, like, I, I need it, I want it, but I have to have this. My life will not be complete if I don't have, you know, whatever they've advertised, you know, Home Depot tools or the car, the food, what have you, right? I mean, that's what the commercials are designed to do, to get you to buy a product or get you to think about a product that you never even thought about before. I mean, how often have you seen a product you never even knew existed, and then all of a sudden you're like, i got to have that. You know, just something really cool. And in the same way in life, we have these desires, these needs, these things that we see. And then there again, if we do not get what we want and we're unhappy about it, we're going to let everybody else know, and we're going to make their life miserable till we get what we want. And that's where the, I punish because you didn't do da 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 da. I am going to do such and such to you till I get it. And there again, kids do it to their parents, husbands do it to their wives, wives do it to their husbands, you do it to your friends, family members. We all do this, unfortunately. And this creates conflicts. Now, the first verse that we looked at in James. What causes fights and quarrels among you? It starts off with the question, what causes all these problems? What causes all these conflicts? Now, the source of conflicts. I want you to think about it for just a couple seconds. But what are the sources? What causes conflicts in your life? What are those items? And as, as we look, you know, these are some of the things that cause conflict in our life. It could be your spouse, you know, they want one thing, you want another thing, and then, you know, when you don't make the compromise, then boom, you have, you know, a fight, quarrel, problem going on. 
uh, with your children, same thing. Uh, family members, you know, they can say you can pick your friends, but not your family. And there's, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, we all have family members that maybe you do not get along with as well. And when you get together, there's a butting of heads. Uh, your, your friends at times, your coworkers. Uh, finances. You know, when, when, they, when they say, why do a lot of people get divorced? That's up there, at, you know, near the top of the list, if not the top of the list of what causes divorce is finances. You know, sometimes you have one person who saves really well and one person who's just a crazy spender. Or even if you're both spenders, they want to buy one thing, you want to buy another, and you only have so much money, you can't get both at the same time. And so then, boom, you've got this conflict. And then health. Think about when you don't feel well, how we react sometimes. Sometimes we're a little grouchy, and then you get the, the medical bills in the mail, and then you're even more grouchy, and there again creates conflict, creates stress on, on your family. Automobile. Don't you hate it? Like, always the most inconvenient times when your car breaks down. And you've got to figure out, how am I going to get to work? How am I going to get to the shop? And then you get the bill for how much it costs to get something fixed. And then you're back up to the finances part. And these things create conflict. They create stress in our lives. And even at church, you work in a ministry and you work with several other people. And you guys sit down for a meeting. And isn't there about five different ways everybody thinks that we should do a certain thing a certain way? And then all of a sudden, there's conflict. And guys, Satan uses these things because he wants to destroy us. He wants to destroy our relationships. He wants to destroy the work going on here at the local church. Satan wants nothing but destruction. And really, in reality, as a body of believers, when we come together here at church, we should have one purpose, one goal, and that's to honor and glorify Christ. And the things that we do, we come together and do that as a group. But how often do we get distracted as a group and Satan gets us pitted against one another, fighting against each other? And I mean, there's even things as silly as in the past, like when we changed from carpet to tile in here, or we used to have pews in here and we put chairs or the color of the chairs, and there were people that didn't like it. There were people who were, you know, getting stressed about it or saying things about it. Is that really that big of a deal? Is that really something that should deter us from the purpose God has for us? And as silly as that is, it happens, doesn't it? And there are times, haven't you ever been like, my wife and I will sit there, you know, you'll be arguing, you'll be fighting intensely, five, ten minutes, whatever later, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, wow, that was really stupid. And I'm like, what were we even fighting about? You know, sometimes I don't even remember that. Or when I think about it, it's like, that was so silly. It was like, why, you know, it ruined our whole evening or our whole day or, you know, whatever over something that was so insignificant. But yet, we all have those needs, we all have those wants, and then when we, you know, don't, uh, you know, give in, we'll get into, you know, the, the solution for this. But when we have those needs and wants, and we stand on our hill, they stand on their hill, and you're like, I'm going to die on this hill, then boom, look where it goes, look what happens. And so we have all these sources of conflict in our lives. Uh, the next part of that verse from verse 1, don't they come from your what? Desires that battle within you. We have that old man, that old nature living inside of us. And it rears its ugly head all the time. And isn't it difficult to fight those emotions, those feelings of doing those things that you want to do? and wanting to get your way. Yes, as Christians, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, but there's still, the Bible says, there's always a battle going on. And sadly, which one wins out quite a bit? The old one. And that's where we get all these family conflicts, these conflicts in our, our relationships with each other. And so they, they, they come from those desires in our hearts. Now, there's some specific Greek words for these in there. I'm not going to go through what the Greek word is, but these are the definitions of what those are to help give a little more meaning to the verses. Uh, your lust, or the word in some translations is desires. And your lust means to desire for pleasure, and that's the I want, 
Remember, we went down through the thing I need, I want, I, I judge, and I punish. And so it's I want. Now, there's, it's a little harder to read because of the color up there. But remember the parable of the sower from Luke. And it says, And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth, and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. But you notice there, what is the problem with this particular group here? Is they are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. And guys, there, there's nothing wrong. God created us to desire things, to have certain things pleasurable in our life. And God, you know, also says that he wants in, in the Psalms that he wants to give us the desires of our heart. Now, you know, we could explain a little more and extrapolate out the good and the bad of that. But nonetheless, let's take, you know, just one example. And if we would use sex, God created that to be a good thing in the right context, in marriage. But when that goes outside of marriage, do we not get a lot of problems? You know, in the case of adultery, it ruins families, ruins lives, uh, you know, ruins relationships, whether you're married or not. Uh, there's diseases, you know, a whole, whole list of a lot of things it causes. Envy, strife, murder, you know, because somebody was cheating on somebody. There's a lot of problems caused when we go outside of the way God designed things. And so even though God created us to enjoy pleasure, but when we take it to certain levels and outside of God's, God's design, we get into these problems. And so there's nothing wrong with, you know, the dad sitting there going, I'd like to go deep sea fishing. There's nothing wrong with the mom wanting to go shopping. But it's what we do and how we go about it and those conflicts that create, that create problems. Now, we talked about these are all of our sources of conflict. And we can always sit there, you know, it's my wife, it's my friends, it's those people at church, it's this, it's that, it's that, whatever. We, we uh, project it on somebody else, something else. It's all these different things of, if I didn't have these in my life, I wouldn't have half the stress I have. Right? We say things like that. But, you know, in reality, looking at Scripture, looking at what we've just read, what is the source of conflict? Self. You. You are the problem. Me. I am the problem. Self. And it's those things that go on in our heart that is the problem, is what creates the conflict. Because, I mean, that's, that's the first couple verses, and as we continue on in James there, itself is where the problem lies. Here's a verse from Luke. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Guys, what you put into your mind, into your life, into your heart, the things you watch, see, do, people you hang out with, those are the things that you're pouring into your heart, and those things come out, okay? And sometimes they can be very good things, and sometimes it can be a dumpster fire, just a disaster. One time I illustrated it this way to the to teens at youth group. I had a trash can sitting up there in front of the youth room. And it had like soda cans, it had trash, it had all kinds of, you know, leftover food, you know, a little bit of soda left in the bottom of them. It was just a messy, smelly trash can. And I said, you, you know, you're throwing in all this garbage in your life, in your heart of the things you're doing, watching people are hanging around with whatever. And then I took them, picked it up, poured it out on the floor all over the room. Those things went all over the place and it was sticky, nasty, smelly. And that's what comes out of our hearts, is those things that we're putting in. And the Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. And so as, as we look at these things, the sources of our conflict is what's in our heart and what we do with that and how we react to those situations. As we continue on in James... You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet. You cannot have what you want. You quarrel and you fight. We don't get our way, and so we get angry. And, you know, even when it says you kill, I mean, there are times do people murder people for things that seem really ridiculous because they didn't get their way. They did not get what they wanted. Covet, and you cannot have what you want, so we fight. 
And taking another one of those words, you lust, is to desire, to long for, to crave, to set one's heart on, to covet. And that's the, the, the next point where it's the I need. You go from the seeing it, the desire of the I want, to the I need this. And, you know, you get, you get to the point as you think and think and dwell on it more, it's like my life will not be complete unless I have this, right? I mean, really, as, as you think about it, think about just different things in your life that you've wanted, and it'll start off as just seeing it, you think about it a little bit, then you think about it a little more, and you're like, I think I'd like that. Then you go to the store, you might look at it, not quite buy it then, but, you know, you think about it more, and you go home, in a day, hours, week, whatever, later, you're back in your body because i got to have this. My life will be complete. Things will be better if I have this. And then, you know, how a lot of times you get it kind of like the day after Christmas, and you're like, oh, it's a big deal. Think about your kids, that toy that they've been wanting and wanting and wanting and bothering you, bothering you for after about five hours on Christmas Day, where is it at? And those needs and wants and desires, I need. And then it moves to the I judge where I deserve this. I have to have it. I've been good. I take care of the family. I take care of this. I do this. I do this. I deserve it. I've got it coming to me. The entitlement. And we see that a lot in our society today, don't we? Because they call that the entitlement society where I'm owed all this. And really, according to the Bible, are we owed anything? No. Because in actuality, what do we deserve? Death and hell. And it's God's grace and mercy that Jesus Christ died for us, something we don't deserve, and providing salvation. And what's even more amazing about it is we don't even have to work for it that he gives us salvation as a free gift. It's mercy and grace. It's not entitlement. But yet, we feel like, I deserve this. I have to have this. I'm owed it because I'm so good. Just look at me. <clears throat> and then another one of the, as far as the definitions of some of the words in the verses, desire to have means to burn with zeal, to boil, to be heated envy, hatred, or anger. And that's the I punish part, where if I didn't get my way, I'm going to make you feel it. You're going to be so sad, so unhappy, the fact that you said no to me. And so I'm going to make you feel my pain, and then some, till you give me what I want. I punish. And so because of all this, we have the family war zone. It's like a battleground sometimes. It's like the tanks, the military's out. You know, you got your side, they got their side, their hill, your hill. And there's just a battle going on. And... Another part of those verses, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, you fight and you war. We get into these battles. And then as the verses continue, you do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. And guys, our Heavenly Father, God, is waiting there for us quite often. We try to take things into our own hands, get by, do whatever we want, without ever consulting God or asking God, our Heavenly Father. And the Bible tells us in Psalms that God desires to give you the desires of your heart. And like I said, we could go into more you know, detail, and I'm not saying every single desire, every single thing you want, God's just going to give it to you. But God does want to show love and care and take care of his children, just as you would do for your kids when you uh, give them something nice and special because you care about them. But here's the important part, is when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with what? Wrong motives. Now, I can sit there and guys, girls, we've all done this before. There's something that you really want and you've been married quite a while and you know your spouse you know that if you just come right up and ask for whatever it is you're going to want, they're going to say no. So you're like, huh, let me rethink this because I really want this. And so you think up of, okay, you know, you make it sound really good to them because you're like, well, you could use this too and it'd be this, this. And, you know, you start off with all the good whatever trying to get them to think, well, that, that's not a bad idea. And so then they, they say yes sometimes. You're like, whoa, that worked. <laughs> but you know your spouse, right? And really, though, here's the thing is, 
you don't always know what's their motive, what's in their heart. And we could, you know, being honest, we're dirty, rotten sinners, and we will do things to get our way and contort things, adjust things a little bit to make it sound good so that we get what we want. And yet, you can never fool God. And yet we try to. Think about in the Bible, different times, you know, different people we've seen. It's like they're trying to trick God. It's like, what are you thinking here? And God knows your motives. God knows your heart. And so those are the things that, you know, God knows it would be something destructive for you, bad for you, for whatever reason. So there's times as God is our Father, will, you know, say no for your own well-being, even though we still really want it really bad. And it's, you know, our pleasures, those things that we seek after, you know, whether they be sinful or not, but, you know, they might start off as not sinful, but then as we go down the road of coveting and desiring and all the things we do, then all of a sudden, you know, there we are, and we're in sin and have a lot of problems. What, why does James call this behavior adultery? Now, even in non-Christian circles, even in our culture today, even with the sin and different things we see, adultery is still considered a really bad thing. Nobody likes to be cheated on. People like faithfulness. And it's a very hurtful, very destructful thing. And in the Old Testament, when you see the nation of Israel, they were... You know, the Bible compares it to a marriage relationship between them and God. They were God's chosen people. And what did Israel continually, continually do? Break God's heart, run after idols, run after the pleasures and things of this world. And when you see different areas, like if you've read Hosea or studied it, how many of you have read Hosea at all? A few, not, not too many. Hosea is about Hosea, and then Gomer, and she's a prostitute. And God tells her and uh, tells him, and there's you know there's a picture. There's two things God's trying to do here, but God tells Hosea, "Go marry her, take her, and marry her." So Hosea does, and after a little while, she cheats, she runs off, she leaves Hosea. And at one point, then God tells Hosea, "Go after her, get her back, show her love and care that she doesn't deserve." So Hosea does. And as you read through and you see, as you read through it, you begin to understand the picture is God of Israel that no matter how bad Israel is, no matter how adulterous and all the terrible things that they do and how badly they treat God poorly, God still loves them. And God tells him he seeks them out. God seeks Israel out. God seeks us out, even though we don't deserve it. We don't deserve God's grace. And that verse is, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. I don't know about you, but I definitely don't want to be the enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason, the spirit that he causes to live in us envies intensely? And so adultery is giving the love that I have promised to my spouse to someone or something else. And then we have spiritual adultery is giving the love I promise to God to someone or something else. Guys, we all struggle with this greatly. We are always giving our hearts, our desires, our passions over towards so many things that are so empty and meaningless, especially in the light of eternity. But even some things are very, just like, like a vapor. I mean, your, your pleasure, your enjoyment is for minutes, an hour, and it's gone. And that's what we invest our heart and our lives into. And yet we're always breaking God's heart who loves us. And as Christians, the Bible says we are the bride of Christ. The question is, is what is my burning desire at this moment? You know, a lot of times, you know, pa Pastor Dean's up here preaching. All of us are guilty of this. You'd be looking at your watch, just going, when is this guy going to get done? And you're thinking about lunch. You're thinking about what you're going to do this afternoon, what, you, you know, this, that, the other. We're thinking about every and anything but 
what's being preached. Guys, this should be the most important time. This is God's word. And yet, do we all not struggle in our mind as you're sitting there and our minds are drifting off here, drifting off there, drifting off wherever, and everything but on what we need to do to work on our hearts and our lives. And we all struggle with it, self-included too. Even when I'm preaching, maybe, I don't know. (laughs) What am I going to do when I'm done? Um, Who or what do I love? Who or what do you love? What do I desire more than pleasing God? And guys, that's a big one, is what desires do we have more than pleasing God? Are those things really all that important? And there again, God created us to, you know, go play sports, have fun with our family and friends and do those things. Those things are all good. But, it, you know, Bible also tells us whatever you do, do all to God's glory. Give it your all, whatever you're doing. You can praise God in every and anything. But guys, so much of the time we put the pleasure above and before and greatly above God continually. Now, we come down to the point of, okay, we got problems, we have conflicts, what do we do about it? And first I would say one thing is to be able to recognize when you see it coming a mile away. You know, it it was always helpful for me after going through counseling and there was a time in my marriage where I was sitting in the counselor's office trying to save my marriage. My wife made me go. Glad I did, though. I went kicking and screaming. And this was many, many years ago now at this time. And after the, that was in the first 10 years of our marriage, and the last 27 uh, years <laughs> has been much, our last 17 years has been much better. And, you know, we, we have the, these uh, thoughts, desires, things that we want, these things that we stand on, and we're just unwilling to give them up because we want what we want. And we all need to come to that realization that, guys, God is more important and pleasing him. And you know what I found, too, that when I started doing it God's way and pleasing him, I started to enjoy life more. And all those you know, things I thought I was going to miss out on, the fun, I actually have more fun now. I get to play with teenagers all the time as an adult. Who could be 48 years old out playing sports all the time with the kids, going to the gym, working out with them, doing this, this, that, I mean, I'm sorry, I know a lot of adults, your idea of fun is going out to dinner, hanging out and talking. I don't, that's not my idea of fun. I want to be out playing. I'm, I'm, I'm still a big kid. And yet doing it God's way is the best way. And to resolve these conflicts, there's some things that we need to look at. What do we do to see it? And first is recognize it coming down the road. And there's the I want, that, that desire, the initial, and that's, that's not bad. And then the I need, and that's where it starts, you know, going downhill from there. But I desire, it's I want, I need, I deserve, and because you didn't, I'm going to punish you. And if we start to recognize and see, okay, here's where we're going, back off and stop before we get that far, that will be helpful. But most importantly, at the end of that passage, uh, verses 6 through 10, be humble. Guys, we are selfish by nature. We are prideful. And think about it. There are times where you're in an argument and you are totally right. And you know you're right. They might even know you're right. And you are not giving in. You're not giving up. And we're not talking about things of biblical importance. We're just talking stupid stuff where, uh, you know, yeah, I seen that red car. No, that car's yellow. I mean, you know, something, something's really insignificant. And you are like, you don't care. You're going to grind them into the ground because you're right. Guys, that's pride. And the Bible tells us to humble ourselves and God will exalt you. And to humble yourself is to realize, you know what? This is not that big and important. I can let this go. I can win this one. The next point is resist Satan. It says, flee from Satan. Remember Joseph, when Potiphar's wife was tempting him, what did he do? Did he hang around? Did he talk sweet nothings to her back? Did he flirt around with her? He ran. He took off and he ran the other way. Guys, we need to run from Satan. Don't play with him. He's been around much longer than we have. He knows all the tricks. He knows way more than we do. And he even knows God's word, as Pastor Dean was talking last week, to use it against you. Flee from Satan. Next is walk with God. Guys, Our relationship with God should be the most important. 
If you never talk to your spouse or rarely talk to them, how good is your relationship going to be? Are we praying regularly? We only seem to pray a lot and regularly when things are bad in our life, when things are going poorly. And all of a sudden we're praying a lot. And I always think to myself, why can't I pray this much and this often when things are good and smooth? And we should. And then the fact of how often are we reading our Bibles? I know, sometimes we get really busy, we've got a lot of things going, and that day you come home, you're so tired, you just eat and fall your face straight into bed. Guys, we need to be talking to God daily. We need to be reading God's Word. Our relationship with God is the most important thing, and yet we neglect it. How about church? Sometimes we come in, I did my duty, I showed up Sunday morning, and that's all the more God needs or gets from me, because the rest of my schedule is busy. And, you know, we do have Sunday night, we have Wednesday prayer group, you know, I have youth group, we have different, you know, we have different ministries, different things going on during the week. And I know you can't meet and be at everything, but usually we put God as down here and then we fill our schedule up here. In reality, God should be the most important. Being a church, doing these things should be the most important, and then our schedule should fall from there. And guys, God will honor you if you honor him. He'll make sure that you get enough time to do the things that you need to do. God gave you all those things. Do you think God also is going to give you the time to get them done? The important things, the things he wants you to get done? Cleanse and change. Guys, there are times where we just need to go to God and I'm sorry, I've messed up. Go to that other person. I'm wrong. And change those things. Not just confess them, but I I need to change this in my life in order to have a better relationship with my spouse, with my kids, with my friends, with my church friends. Be broken. Remember David. David did some really bad things. I mean, I don't think anybody in the room here has killed anybody. I hope not. But then, you know, he committed adultery, and there are many other things in Scripture. But yet, what's the Bible say about David? He's a man after God's own heart. Why? Because every time that he came to the point, he was broken over his sin. He really genuinely felt bad. Sometimes we go, I've got God's forgiveness. I have God's grace. I'll just do it again because he's just going to forgive me anyway. And the Bible says, you know, we shouldn't have that kind of attitude. The Bible says, God forbid. And then you notice here, it bookends. What's the point that's up at the top that's also up at the bottom in that verse 10? Stay humble. There must be an important thing there that we all struggle with pride. And God's telling us to humble ourselves. And there again, I tell you, there's times where I might be totally right, or my wife might be totally right, but sometimes just giving in whatever so that we don't have that conflict flaring up is worth much more. Kind answer turns away wrath. Soft answer turns away wrath. There are things that are just not that important. God's what should be the most important. And the relationships and good relationships is what should be the most important. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for this gate you've given us. We ask, Lord, that you would help us in our relationships, Lord.